Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Matthew Feeney. Joining us today is Richard Vetter, Distinguished Professor of Economics Emeritus at Ohio University and Director of the Center for College Affordability and Productivity and Adjunct Scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Richard. Glad to be with you. So a lot of discussion happens about higher education, cost, quality. It's a, It's been a hot topic recently. But maybe we just need to get a scope of the problem. How how bad right now is the problem for exp- how expensive higher education is, student debt, quality? Is it pretty bad or is it overblown? Well, I think it's a pretty serious problem. I mean, it is a, a area of human endeavor. We spend three percent of our national output on, uh, which is to say five six hundred billion dollars a year. Involves the lives of twenty million students at any moment of time who are going to college, which is not an inconsequential number of people. Uh, there are three huge problems that I, if I, I can outline it and I could do it in 10 words if I was compelled to. But uh, <laughs> being a college professor, I'll take 100 probably to do it. Uh, a college education is too costly. It's too expensive. That's the first problem. Uh, there's second problem is there's too little learning going on in college. That's a little harder to substantiate, but I think it's real. And the third problem, and it's also a big one, is that too many recent graduates of college are really underemployed. They're not getting uh, the kinds of jobs that they expected to get when they enter college, nor the kind of jobs that traditionally college graduates have gotten. So on all ways you look at it, it's not doing too well. And all of that ignores several other problems that many of your listeners are probably interested in, namely the lack of intellectual diversity in higher education, the lack of uh, tolerance of diverse views, uh, the free the trigger warnings and free uh, speech codes and all of the uh, abominations around those things. Uh, Scandals in intercollegiate athletics would be another example. And I could go on and on. Buildings that are opulent and extravagant that are uh, subsidized indirectly by taxpayers that have little educational function or purpose. Uh, There's a whole variety of what we might call secondary areas, but I've sort of outlined the main problems, I think. Well, I think we would love to talk about all three of these points, but I have a a question about the first one, which is, uh, how did we get to a point that it is so costly? I I often hear from people older than me, of course, who say, you know, I went to college and I paid for it with summer jobs and uh, summer, you know, working part time. Uh, What went wrong? How did we get here? Well, um, uh, let me, as a historical uh, background say that the tuition at Harvard in 1840 was $75 a year, Hmm. which was about a little less than one year's income of the average American at the time. The tuition at Harvard now is pushing $50,000, which is about one year's income of the people. It's the only thing that I know of that I can think of that is burdensome to people today. In fact, it's probably a little more burdensome today than, than it, as a, an expense item than it was 176 years ago in 1840. And how do we get there? Well, there's a lot of theories and reasons, and and not all of it is related to public policy, but a good bit of it is. Hmm. Uh, uh, the, The biggest culprit in terms of public policy probably is the massive expansion of federal student of financial assistance programs, which in today's dollars were far less than $10 billion in 1970. And uh, today are closer to 200 billion. So there's been a 20, 25 fold growth in those programs in 45 years. And you would think, well, gee, that'll make college more affordable for students. Uh, Colleges have raised their tuitions uh, levels uh, accordingly. And I think most of the benefits, if any of those programs have gone to the colleges themselves, their professors, people like me who have lower teachers 
teaching loads now, earn more money, have more trips to Europe and all the amenities we like. Uh, 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 administrators are uh, excessive in no number and excessive in pay and excessive in stupidity. Well, I shouldn't have said that, <laughs> but I just did, I guess. Uh, I mean, we, we, it, it, a lot of it is related to that problem. There, there are, I would you know, the, the traditionally, it's some people say that education is like teaching, like theater, really. Like, uh, take uh, King Lear, which I'll use Shakespeare since he died 400 years ago this year. Uh, uh, it takes as many actors today to perform King Lear as it did in 1610 or whenever it was that Shakespeare wrote King Lear. And uh, teaching is like that. You know, uh, I'm a professor, I'm an actor, I get up in front of 30, 40, 50 students, just like I did 50 years ago when I started teaching. I'm still teaching. I'm teaching the same course the same way to the same number of students today as I did 50 years ago. That's the truth. I'm not making that up. So zero productivity growth, and yet wages in the economy are going up with general productivity growth. So you have to pay professors more, and that, in other words, causes some inflation. There's some truth to that argument, but only a little truth. I mean, we have... Faculty are only a quarter of the employees at a typical university or a third, maybe a third of the budget goes for faculty salaries, two-thirds goes for other things. So that can't explain all this inflation uh, in its entirety. We have MOOCs and we have uh, online education. We have, should have technological advances to help lower those costs. Uh, and uh, you know, technology has lowered the cost of doing business almost everywhere else in the economy. Why hasn't an education? Indeed, in education, many colleges say, we, we have to put a technology fee on. We have to charge them more because we want to use new technology. Well, if the say the Ford Motor Company said they were going to put a technology f uh, fee on because we have to put new machines in to build our cars, uh, they would be la well, they would be bankrupt shortly. Uh, so it, it's 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 a different world. But the, the American economy, as you said, it's a different world. The American economy has changed a lot, uh, just in terms of the kind of labor that people do, the kind of jobs that are required. My parents, my dad was the first one to graduate college, and he ended up going to law school. And I think at about that time in 1969, it was about 11 percent of people had college degrees. Yeah. And so you could differ differentiate yourself as a high school diploma, but then you need to get college. And now increasingly, you need to differentiate yourself through graduate degrees because more people are going to college. And that just seems like a good general growth in the education level of Americans could do the kind of jobs that require yeah, to do, yeah. less, less breaking rocks and more programming computers. Yeah, you're raising an interesting point. It used to be and that college was a signaling device. You had a piece of paper. I am a college graduate. And even if you went to a, 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 I hope I don't offend some of your listeners, if you went to Slippery Rock State College in Pennsylvania, which is not you know, considered to be one of the, the leaders in American higher education, and, and maybe have a sort of a mid middling re reputation or even below middling reputation, you, you'd, people would say, yeah, he's pretty cool or she's pretty cool. Uh, he's part of the, the top 10 percent. We it wasn't top 1 percent, but at least the top 10 percent or 11 and, and so even people going to schools of mediocre reputation, getting a bachelor's degree with mediocre grades still was somehow special. Uh, they were in the – at the minimum, they're in the top quartile of the population in um, smarts and uh, general uh, ability to perform in the eyes of employers and everything. Uh, Today, when you got over 30 percent of the population with college degrees and over half the population at least going to post-secondary schooling of some sort, it's no longer special. And a person who's at the bottom of their class at a sort of a, a mediocre quality school, maybe even below the average of the American population as a whole. So no longer does that piece of paper, uh, is, it, is it a good signaling device? So you get a master's degree. I've been predicting we will offer a master's degree in janitorial science, uh, which is being uh, mopping floors. There are over 100,000 people in the 2010 census with bachelor's degrees who are janitors. And there were over 5,000 with master's degrees who are janitors. So I think that will be the thing. You know, you will need a master's degree to 
wash windows or mop floors. And is, is, is that make any sense? I think you can ask that question. Well, that brings me on to the, um, the second question I had, which actually relates to the second point you made about too, too little learning. So is that uh, professors still want to teach the right kind of things, but they're doing it poorly? Or is it that they're not even teaching the right kind of things? Uh, and I suppose a tag-on question at the end of that is, what do you think a university or college should be for? What, what role should it play in society? I was afraid you were going to ask that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> let's get no, philosophical. Yeah, yeah, let's get philosophical. No, it's, a, it's an ex the, the latter part is the excellent. But even just starting out with the earlier part of your mm -hmm. question, uh, uh, are we teaching poorly or, or, or what is the problem? And it's a little bit of, of everything. The, there's data from the U.S. Department of Labor that says that in the mid-60s, uh, the typical college student spent 40 hours a week on academic pursuits, full-time student. Today, they spend 27 hours a week, one-third less time to get the same number of college credits as they did 50 years ago. And why? Well, it, we are not asking as much of our students. So does that mean we're doing our job poorly? I think you could argue it does mean that. Uh, and of course, the major, the most obvious manifestation of that is our grades that we give. Uh, in the mid-60s, uh, the typical grade in a college course was about a C, C grade or C plus grade. So the, truly the, average is supposed to be. The GPA, if you the grade point average of all students in the United States, undergraduate students are about a 2.4, 2.5. Now it's about a 3.1, uh, which is above a B average. It's between a B and a B plus. In some disciplines, uh, I'll pick education as one. Uh, we do have colleges of education, which I, by the way, just as a afterthought, I think we should abolish. I think if if we if we're going to use have military uh, uh, training and we're going to bomb things, we ought to bomb colleges of education out of existence. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm something of a pacifist, by the way, but if I would make an exception for bombing colleges of education, <laughs> but uh, the uh, colleges of education, a, a typical school, the typical grade is a B plus, about a 3.6, 3.7 average. So they just don't believe in giving grades. So why should a student work very hard? Why should they study very much? Why shouldn't they spend time going to the local recreational center or go drinking or uh, engaging in all sorts of wild hedonistic activities, which uh, we won't de go into detail here, some of which are very fun, a lot of fun, but should we be subsidizing them uh, as taxpayers? And I, I, I question that. Well, that's an interesting point, too, because college has created an image, I would say, since about the 60s of having... It's a, it's a consumer good just being there, being in a frat, going to your parties and playing beer pong, making sure you make a lot of mistakes. It's, you know, it's the kind of find yourself kind of mission, which is maybe what, partially what we're paying for, that, that we have wealthier parents who paid for their kids to go find themselves while having – getting an English degree and a religious studies degree. Is that something that's bad? I mean, should we be condemned that, giving them a four-year kind of club I, med? I, I, I think – it, it's not only not bad, I think it's a, sort of a natural byproduct of a more affluent society. People get wealthier. They want their children to live better than they did. And part of that is, oh, sometimes people will send their kids off to do a gap year after school of traveling around Europe or Asia or something like that, which earlier generations could not afford to do. Uh, and some people send their kids to something we call colleges for a gap five years, it used to be four, but it's increasingly five or six, where you spend, you dabble in education a little bit and you dabble in uh, having fun and you dabble in drinking and you dabble in sex and you dabble in drugs. Uh, but the, you know, we argue that that's part of the uh, acculturation process, part of the maturation process of growing up. Those are things that you do and there's nothing wrong with it. Where I have some problem though is who pays for it uh, and should we, for example, 
uh, have free college for all, as Bernie Sanders argued, or a variant of that uh, Secretary Clinton is arguing right now. And should we subsidize that? Should hardworking people who maybe didn't go to college and are from families with thirty or forty thousand, fifty thousand dollar incomes, be subsidizing people making twice as much money, whose kids are going off to college and uh, doing a little learning, they're getting some learning done, but they're also spending a lot of time doing these other things. Uh, I don't mind people having fun, but I don't want them to do it on my dime. I want it to, them to do it on their dime. If we're trying to separate these these cultural, because the way I kind of think about this problem is that we have a we could have a cultural economic change, and then we have a public policy change that is not necessary. So some of these are just a good growth of an educated society, uh, of, a, of a very rich society where people's adolescence is now extended to thirty. I mean, thirty is the new twenty, correct? We need to all spend five years in Europe finding ourselves after four years of college finding ourselves, and you might end up finding yourself in a coffee shop in Amsterdam or something like that. But that's that's what an affluent society does, as you said. So that's the cultural side, and then the governmental side. So what we can actually do about this. So we talked about federal funding and I, and I couldn't tell how much the federal student aid, how much you put on on very, very easy to obtain federal student aid. Is that a big well, part of this? Well, let's, let's first of all, let's look at the numbers and uh, how do you define the money? So a lot of this are kids are paying back loans. So is it really – government or not. But if, since it's guaranteed by the government, even the uh, college board counts it as federal student aid. And those numbers add up to a number close to $200 billion these days. The total spending on higher ed is a five, six hundred billion dollar, five hundred billion dollar enterprise, a little over that close, getting gone towards six hundred. So it's a big deal. It's not a little deal. That's more than state governments give in subsidies to, to universities. So it is the big uh, – it's a big factor. And one wonders that even if you believe that there ought to be some uh, special provisions for egalitarian reasons to provide opportunity to lower income people, for example, that whether th this is very efficient because that's – more, many of those 20 million, many people are forgetting uh, tuition tax credits. Now, I'm a low tax guy, as uh, anyone at the Cato Institute would attest, uh, but uh, I don't believe giving tax credits to go to college as opposed to doing something else is a the optimal use of money and at least when you're giving those to people who, from families with $100,000, $150,000 a year, is that an appropriate use of federal subsidies? Uh, and there's about $20 billion or so of those, that money given out. There's another $40 billion, $30 or $40 billion given out, out in Pell Grants, which are grants. But even those grants are not given right to the students. They're given – they're sent to the financial aid offices of these schools. Then you have to come in and kind of beg for them even though it's money that's in your name. Uh, I, I've always argued that even if you're going to do that program, at the minimum, give the money to the students directly so that you empower them a little bit. So maybe they'll decide they don't want to go to your university th this semester. They want to go to some other university or if they get turned down from classes they want to take, they go somewhere else. So, so I think there's a lot of problems with the program. But if you had uh, – how much is the uh, interest rate guarantee on the federal system? Well, how much is that a subsidy? Because yeah. if you, it seems to me that if you had – if you had to go to a bank and take a loan out, mm -hmm. they might actually – let's just say there were no federal student aid whatsoever or only very little amount of it. They would, you would, they would ask you things like, well, what are you planning on majoring in? And if you said puppetry, they may give you a 12 percent interest rate. But if you said engineering or business, they may give you a 5 percent interest rate because that's the way the market would work. And so the government just gives you one interest rate. That's right. The government programs have no commercial, no economic basis to them. There is an idea out by the way that that is gain favor uh, for something called income share agreements, which is a, sort of a, a private approach to funding college, which is kind of appealing because under this scheme, a student would go to say a bank or somewhere and say, 
I want you to finance half the cost of my going to college. I have enough cash and so forth to finance half of it. I want to go to such and such a university. I'll need $40,000 for the next four years. Uh, what will it cost me for you to get to pay that 40000 and instead of giving you the student a loan, they'll give. They'll say to the student, "Sell us five percent of yourself for the next ten years, or seven percent, or ten percent. You will pay us five or seven or ten percent, whatever the amount might be of your income. It might be for five years. It might be for fifteen. And picking up on your point, an excellent point, is if you had an unimpeded market in that, you would get great information, enormously useful information. The MIT kids even the, uh, 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 will be able to borrow that money or uh, they're not really borrowing their money. They would be getting those funds for a very small hunk of their income for a very few years and the kids majoring in gender studies at Chicago State University University uh, will be paying 30 percent of their income for the next 200 years or, well, for the rest <laughs> of their life <laughs> till death do us part. Uh, and that's, that provides information and, it, it, and the market then is saying, we don't really want many gender studies maybe – and I'm making that up. I don't know what the data really would show. But I have a feeling that electrical engineering major from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology would be a pretty solid investment uh, perceived by markets that way. And I have a feeling that MIT would be looked at better than the University of District Columbia or – and I'm not picking on that institution, but it just doesn't have a, as good of an academic reputation. So this reminds me of a question I had uh, coming in here, which is uh, what, what other options – should exist? Because it seems to me that there are universities and colleges that train people for professions that you didn't even need a degree for. So is the answer uh, more trade schools? Uh, is the answer uh, apprenticeships or other vocational training? What, 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 what do you think would be? Well, I think we do need some more of that kind of stuff. I think there's too much emphasis on bachelor's degrees and not enough on providing just useful educational opportunities for students that often would be uh, technical schools, career colleges, learning how to braid hair, uh, 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 weld. Uh, welders make tremendous amounts of money, I am told. Driving these big 18-wheel trucks is very uh, remunerative. I mean, it's, at least it pays reasonably well. And you could learn to do that in a year probably rather than four years or five years. But there's another option too. I, I, I agree that those are part one way. Maybe we should – have a national. This I'll just throw an idea out, and you can blow it up if you want. Let's create something we'll call the NC, and the NC is actually NCEE. -E. That stands for the National College Equivalence Examination. We give exams. Colleges thrive on exams. We that's how we evaluate our students. Our exams. We we just accept them in the first place. You have to take the collegiate aptitude test or the ACT test or something. Uh, uh, when they graduate, they will take the GRE, the graduate record exam, to see if they're fit, fit for graduate school. Let's have all our students and not anyone. Uh, Twelve-year-old kids, a uh, kid in grade school, could take the NCE, and uh, and then I mean, let's say t uh, th all the kids who go to a certain university. Uh, let's let's say we set as a national standard a sixty. If you have less than a sixty. You're considered less than bachelor certified, bachelor's degree certified. If you have more than that, uh, you have a bachelor. Aren't you? So people instead will ask, did, where did you go to school? They might ask, what did you do on the NCEE? When you, you might say, well, you can't make a single test up that covers all disciplines, and that's true. But I mean, we somehow deal with this other in other things. So we give them a two-hour general test, give them a little a few questions in history and literature and mathematics and foreign languages. Uh, general knowledge, what an educated person should know. 
an hour and a half would do it, actually, to be honest. Uh, and critical thinking skills, have them write a f answer, an essay, a little. And then a couple hours of questions. Uh, uh, so a test them on critical thinking. And then have, uh, have them have a segment where they are their major field, where you ask them questions from their major field. You could do all this in three and a half, four hours. We do it all the time with other tests. Uh, to, to be a, in the foreign service of the United States, you uh, take a test something like that. So why not do this? And uh, that might be, and, you know, charge a kid 100 bucks to take the test. And uh, the kid might be, the employers might catch on. Well, hey, uh, we want kids who do, uh, who do well on that test. It correlates very well with the kind of skills we want as uh, employees. And so maybe, maybe we could change the whole name of the game. And yeah. So, uh, in a world in which there is the NCEE, uh, there would still be a place for universities to teach the, the liberal arts and the hard sciences for those more sure. academically minded. And uh, I think, you know, we couldn't have this conversation without mentioning at least once the state of the liberal arts. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm, before talking, uh, before th this question, uh, we briefly discussed uh, the state of, you know, trigger warning, safe spaces, things like that. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on what you think the state of the liberal arts is, well, even the sort of things universities should be doing. I'm an economist, and so I'm accused of being very vocationally oriented. But the reality is I'm very liberal arts biased, pro-liberal arts biased. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time in college doing s seemingly silly things like studying French literature in French uh, and, you know, things that uh, – but I think back on it now and I think those are some of the most rewarding moments of my life. And uh, I think we have de-emphasized the liberal arts too much uh, as a general proposition. Uh, the data tend to support this. Students are spending far less time taking courses in the humanities, philosophy, uh, languages, uh, literature, history. Uh, and even the social sciences, I feel a little less uh, warm and fuzzy about the social sciences because some of them I don't think teach very much. Uh, but uh, I think as a whole, people do need to have some – I think people can think better and think more critically and have a better context in which to evaluate uh, human situations if they've had a, a, a sort of a broad range of study that includes a little bit of philosophy and a little bit of, uh, you know, everyone should have read Plato's Republic and everyone should read a little bit of Shakespeare and uh, – um, um, Maybe everyone should take an economics course. I'm, I kind of think probably, but I'm less excited about that than I am about the the Shakespeare. And uh, so, uh, the data show a decline in the uh, humanities, and uh, even the so-called liberal arts colleges are now emphasizing business majors and all of this sort of stuff. And uh, I think a little bit's uh, 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 too bad. And if you look at the data, by the way, uh, uh, this is my favorite statistic uh, from payscale.com, mid-career earnings of philosophy majors versus business administration majors. The philosophy majors pass the business administration uh, majors about 15 years in their career. So even if you look at uh, education is nothing more than a vocational exercise, which I don't, uh, I think uh, there's a, a case to be made for the liberal arts. Well, both Matthew and I are philosophy majors, so I, oh, we like yeah. the statistic very well. But, oh, but, <laughs> well, uh, uh, Bill Bennett, uh, a former secretary of education uh, w w and uh, uh, another fellow uh, 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 that I know, uh, Alec Pollack, both graduated from Williamson with a philosophy major about 40 years ago. Both did extremely well. One of them uh, got a PhD in philosophy. Uh, the other one is, became a successful banker. Uh, one of them became very, uh, you know, made a lot of money writing books and uh, so forth. And uh, th they both uh, think that the reason it all happened was their philosophy major. I'm not sure Williams College is the right place, although it's a good school. But that, but that's the, the interesting question back to what you had said about sort of choosing the right majors for 
human capital for actual job skills because mm-hmm. it, we, we talked about we kind of threw gender studies under the bus a little bit, which I'm all for. Uh, maybe religious studies, we can talk about all these other majors that might be bad. But then there's a lot of people who would say, as you just said, that the liberal arts, even if it doesn't give you job skills, is just good for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think Shakespeare gives you job skills, but it's just good for you to read Shakespeare. Yeah. So maybe you know your Bernie Sanders uh, supporter would say, I think the government should be subsidizing that for America's youth in the same way they think that high school should have – you know, you should read John Steinbeck in high school and job skills be damned. This is part of being a good citizen. Well, you know, you raise some very interesting questions. Where do you draw the line about what, what pub, the public – sector or what the government should do in providing education, should they provide any at all? Uh, uh, in the Industrial Revolution, when it happened in Great Britain, it was most interesting. You had a late colleague here at the uh, – Andrew uh, Coulson. Uh, Andrew Coulson, who was a friend of mine. And Andrew pointed out, and I, I teach this stuff, that in Great Britain, which had an industrial revolution between 1750 and 1850 that began the greatest change in the betterment of human welfare that the world ever happened, had and ever will have, uh, that that happened in school. Kids were learning in private schools. There wasn't a dime, not a, uh, or I should say, a farthing, I guess, or a <laughs> shilling. Uh, you sound like you might have a British. Bag. He has an idea. A giddy would be another possible <laughs> one. One of the above. I'm sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you look like you're a part of the the vast British Empire of some. Uh, what remains of yes. what, what <laughs> remains of it. Uh, uh, Anyway, the uh, to 1830, there wasn't a penny spent, and uh, the, the, there then the, there was a little sort of a intermediate stage. It was about 1870 that the, the, the education was thoroughly uh, made public, uh, uh, nationalized, if you like, in Great Britain, and the country fared pretty well. In the United States, in as late as 1940. Most kids going to college and universities went to private schools, not to public schools, as late as 1940. And this was long after our, uh, you know, we had uh, achieved uh, supremacy, uh, economic supremacy. So I am one who sort of questions the very basic assumption that education is a public good that therefore needs to be publicly financed. Uh, it's certainly though – if you do, and you can make a case for it. But if you do, where do you draw the line? Where do you stop? Does everyone have the fundamental right to a PhD? Uh, I mean why is it at age 17 we will – pay your way through school and at age 18, you will say, it's time now for you to start paying some of your way. And why there? Why at 18? Why not at 12? Why not – or why not at 25? Bernie Sanders would say, at, why ever, but at 25, uh, 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 others would say 12. I think there's uh, – we ought to be looking into the 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 true – everyone uh, – the positive spillover effects of education. Shortly before he died, Milton Friedman and I had a conversation on this, if I may share this with you. Please, uh, yeah. Because uh, it seems like that might be an appropriate person to reference. Uh, Friedman in his book that he wrote, Capitalism and Freedom, said – well, he was generally very skeptical of government interventions in, in human life. He did think that there was a role for some public fin- financing of higher education because of the public betterment, the uh, positive spillover effects and so forth. Uh, around 2000, I, 2002 actually to be precise, I wrote him – sent him an email. I said, Milton, do you still believe this? And he wrote back and he s- said, well, there probably are some positive spillover effects through education, but there are sure a lot of negative spillover effects as well. And he says it is an interesting empirical question whether we ought to be uh, subsidizing higher education or taxing it. And um, he had 
he was clearly become very skeptical of the view that government should be involved in the financing of higher education. And uh, I, I, I think he made a very valid point. We were talking about the – you mentioned the, the National Collegiate uh, Equivalency Exam, which I think is a really interesting idea because we have to – if we're going to try and not blow up the system but at least unpack it into more useful constituent points and not have this monolithic model that might be a little bit antiquated for the modern age, we might have to do things like we need to get a signaling device that signals that you know enough. But there's another problem here. We, we need to – the part of the college diploma signals that you know how to get up at 9 a.m., turn in a paper when it's due, uh, you know, attend class. Think those are the job skills. You know, my dad jo always jokes that college diplomas really should say this piece of paper certifies that this person can do the kind of things that a person needs to do to get this piece of paper, which is but is a valuable signaling device for for empo possible employers beyond just do you know who the king of England was in 1540. How do we g give those signals if we're going to try and extricate ourselves from the pure college model and have more printed how we how can we give those signals to prospective employers? aside from just knowledge? Well, uh, somehow in the middle of that question, I got thinking of a friend of mine who owns a series of McDonald's restaurants. And my friend, most of whose employee, about I'd say half of them never go to college. Half of them go, you know, he, he, most of them are 16, 17, 18 years old. He always asserted to me that he probably did more to help persons become equipped for job markets than colleges did because he said, you will be at work at X time, 12 p.m., and if you're here at 12.03, I'm going to dock your pay because we are expecting you here at 12. If you uh, have dyed your hair yellow overnight or pink overnight and put three rings in your nose, which is offensive to our customers, uh, I'm being very politically incorrect here, no doubt, uh, we're not going to employ you anymore. So there's a dress code. There's a, 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 a time code. We don't want to hear you use swear. We don't want to swear. We don't want to see you chewing gum while you're serving customers. There's a, a set of, of rules, uh, do's and don'ts that we teach some in college, but I think we teach at least I think most of that is learned on the job and even college graduates learn most of it on the job. Most college graduates, you know, they get up well, sometimes they get up at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning, but more often than not, they get up at 10 or 11. And on Fridays, they don't go to class much anymore, so they sleep in. Uh, or they're out partying till 4 in the morning, and so they are hungover. Uh, and when they go to work, I, I love to talk to kids uh, six months after they've graduated from college and they're coming back from their first job. Oh, my gosh. Oh, this is a different <laughs> world I'm in. It, you know, it's different. I got to, uh, you know, I got to dress up for uh, work. I can't wear T-shirts and uh, so forth. And uh, so I think a lot of what we need for the workplace is is a really non-formal education skills. I don't want to denigrate the importance of college. And colleges do teach some real skills. I mean, accounting is, has specialized knowledge that you need. Colleges are a good place to learn. Engineers have specialized knowledge. There's, but I, you know, I don't know. What is a community? I'm going to get myself in trouble. Communications majors, education I think those majors. are the athletes, right? Ed, huh? <laughs> I mean the communications degree holders are the athletes. Yeah. yeah That's the yeah. joke. And, uh, yeah. And, and, and the, there are a lot of mushy ma uh, majors. And even things like art, uh, which I, th I think it's legitimate for the university to teach – the arts and fine arts. In fact, I think that's a, a nice part of the you – know, I'm a supporter of that. But uh, really how much of art is learned you know, through formal instruction and how much is learned in, in other ways. There are, in other words, other ways to teach besides the formal uh, education process. So some, some listeners might think it interesting that um, 
the three of us who have all benefited from higher education are bemoaning the the state of affairs. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. um, the, we are a bit pessimistic, aren't right? We? Uh, and and some listeners might uh, for for the younger listeners uh, might be interested to hear what what you think uh, they should do uh, if if they are academically minded, but uh, they realize uh, getting one of these degrees uh, will be very expensive, and when they finish, uh, there will be thousands of other people with the same sort of degrees. What uh, if any advice do you have for the eighteen year old who wants to go to college? Well, that's the the bottom line question, really, for uh, uh, many uh, uh, people. And I think the answer varies from individual to individual. I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all answer to that question. That's why I very much disagree with what I call the college-for-all crowd, who says everyone should go to college blanket. The kid who is graduating from a, pr a good private school or even a decent suburban public school or a, a high-quality inner-city public school, doesn't matter, good quality school in the top 10 percent of their class uh, who uh, does very well on tests and so forth. Uh, who is uh, who has excelled in student activities uh, in addition to studying uh, both athletics and non-athletic activities, those students are going to be able to get into a very high quality school and they're going to uh, excel. The average graduate of Duke University earns more than twice as much as the average earnings of students at the North University of North Carolina at Greensboro, which is located less than 100 miles away. Uh, the life experiences are, if you get into Duke, you're going to do well. 95% of the kids who go to Duke graduate from Duke. At North Car uh, University of North Carolina at Greensboro, it's 50-50. You got a 50% chance of graduating and a 50% chance you won't graduate. So uh, people learn very early, still in high school, whether what they could do. And if uh, the best they can do is get in a, a, a school of some marginal reputation, they, they may be uh, – and uh, their high school grades were in the bottom one-fourth, a quarter of their class. They might ask themselves, maybe do I really want to go to a traditional four-year college? Maybe to uh, hedge my bets, I'll go to a two-year uh, community college where, by the way, the dropout rates are huge, very, very high. Or I'll go to one of these for-profit schools for a year or two years if I do well. If I don't do well, I am at least minimize my losses to one year or two years rather than four years and maybe ten or $20,000 worth instead of $100,000. Or they might say, hey, let's go to truck driver school. I always wanted to drive a truck or I love working working outdoors. I, I want to be uh, working construction, but maybe I ought to go uh, to uh, one of my former – great former students learned how to build houses. He, went, he, he just built houses for a year. I think it's great. Someone has to build houses uh, and, uh, you know, three or four years later, doesn't have a college degree, but he's making – uh, good money, probably forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, and uh, happy as a lark. Is there is there a status problem that could develop here though? Because that we we do, and maybe that's the problem. We look down on to some yeah. extent truck drivers. I, I mean, I I hope I don't, but but I think generally society does. And so if someone makes a decision to go to truck driving school or go to plumbing school, uh, there They're could be down. a class – the status difference here. There could be yeah, a pernicious. Yeah, but why does that exist? Yeah, you're absolutely right. That does exist to some extent. But part of it is our political leaders and even our high school guidance counselors maybe in our – the Lumina Foundation and the Gates Foundation, all these foundations uh, founded by yuppies, most of whom, by the way, did not graduate from college. <laughs> uh, uh, or they got like an English degree. Uh, uh, I don't mean to make fun of Bill Gates. He's a brilliant man, but he didn't graduate from college. Uh, you know, they say you got to go to college. You got to go, to, and that adds to the stigma if you don't go to college. So we are encouraged that. Some say, and there's some truth is, I, I, I am usually not one to promote European values uh, in the because I think Americans uh, have on a whole higher quality of life than Europeans, but. Uh, it is said that in Germany, and I think there's some truth to this, that the German uh, vocational education system is is much much better than ours because that stigma problem is far far less. It's it's much uh, le less obvious, 
And I, I think there's something to be said for that. So uh, we, we, you know, 50 years ago, we did have uh, vocational high schools, vocational post high schools, and we still do to some extent, but they weren't looked on quite as negatively as they are today. They've become more and more shunned. Oh, that's just for the people who can't make it in life, you know. What should we think about plans or suggestions to do student loan forgiveness? I am very much against student loan forgiveness. It sounds, you know, hard-hearted. It sounds like you're mean. You don't like people. But if we start becoming very generous in forgiving student loans, you first of all have what us economists call the moral hazard problem. You're going to college. You take out – you'll say – your parents will probably tell, tell a kid, borrow all you can. The government's not going to make you pay it back anyway. So you, you look at the borrowing almost originally as a grant rather than a loan. And so then we have a massive problem. It, 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 the more you forgive loans, the fewer people who will even willingly make payments on them. So that's the, uh, uh, a problem. It sends the wrong message uh, uh, to people. It says uh, if you uh, fail in life, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover your, your, yourself. There's no downside to poor – and many people who don't pay back their loans don't – are because they do poor academically in school. They don't graduate from school. Now, do you want to see these people literally die of starvation? Of course not. We're a compassionate society, but uh, you know, even the, the you know the Salvation Army and the uh, Saint Vincent de Paul Society and the Habitat for Humanities, a lot of private philanthropies uh, help these people, and maybe even, and arguably, the government itself. But you don't need to forgive them their loans. A loan is a loan is a loan. Uh, uh, and you made the point earlier, a very valid point, is we really ought to commercialize loans more. Uh, when you go to borrow, uh, we, we ought to tell people, what you're proposing to do is risky. And we perceive it as risky. And so we're going to charge you a little higher interest rate on your loan. And, or what you're, you're, you want to go to MIT and engineering, you've got a – uh, off-the-wall SAT score and you were number one in your class in high school, go, go for it. We'll give you a 2 percent loan because we want to encourage that. I mean if the government's going to get in the lending business, which I'm against, they're in it. I would prefer them to get out. But at least uh, uh, take account of the, the differences here. The government is encouraging people to uh, linger around school. Uh, uh, Let's suppose. Let's talk about Pell. Can I real? Please, yeah, I, please. Let's take a Pell Grant person. Here's two students. One of them is brilliant, hardworking, works day and night, graduates from college in three years. Easily possible, by the way. Go to summer school, etc. Take overloads uh, during the year. You can graduate in three years. I had a son that graduated in three years. He wasn't unusually brilliant, but he graduated in three years. No, no difficult. Graduated Phi Beta Kappa, a very good student. It can be done. So here you got a student who graduates in three years on Pell Grants all the way through. Let's say he gets a five thousand dollar annual Pell Grant. He gets fifteen, or she gets fifteen thousand dollars in Pell Grants. Here's student number two. Student number two fails half the courses she takes or he takes, uh, uh, gets into – has a drug problem, alcohol problem, et cetera, et cetera, takes six – but does graduate in six years. That student will get 30 – will get 30,000 in uh, Pell Grants. The good student will get 15. The poor student will get 30. That's just the way it works. The federal government rewards poor performance. If you perform more poorly, we'll give you more money than if you perform good, well. Now that is sheer craziness. It is – it's idiocy. It's – and you say, well, we ought to have put more money into need-based aid. But let's – if we're going to even want to go that route, at least have put in some standards. Uh, we have 40 percent of the kids who enter college don't graduate. Don't graduate. That's madness. We waste those resources. 
So you're getting me all excited here. I'm sorry. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Please, please. that's a good yeah. For, yeah, you're getting me. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I want to start, you know, let's, <laughs> uh, let's go to war against let's, the Let's college. go to the DOEs let's, down the street. We can go up there with the let's, pitchforks let's, right now. Let's start a demonstration. That's the the, the, the in thing to do on college <laughs> campuses Exactly. So, so what can we – in the immediate near-term future, if you were to advocate for – some public policy changes uh, that could, you know, not you know, burn down the DOE or something like that, but just things that might have a big effect if we make some changes. Maybe some better requirements on Pell grants and student loans, or actually, yeah, try to make we could like cut. This. We could cut the costs of the the, the government expenditures by forty percent in the fi student financial assistance area without fundamentally reducing a to a regular full-time student who has genuine need uh, at all. Uh, there, there's – first of all, uh, 10 percent or more of the money goes for the student uh, tuition tax credits. A lot of that goes to middle-income families. 10 percent or so the money goes to parents, not to the students, to parents who, by the way, don't have to start repaying loans till six months after their kids graduate from school, which is crazy. What does the kids graduating school have to do with the parents' capacity to repay the loan? Uh, the, the, you know, that's dubious. Why are you giving money to parents rather than to students? Uh, uh, we, uh, we have a lot of students who take six years, borrow money for five and six years. Maybe we should put a time limit on it. Five years, period. You know, the degrees are advertised as four-year degrees. Maybe we put four years on. Maybe I'd give, be generous and say five. That still would save a fair amount of money. What about law school, uh, MBA programs? What about a kid going to get an MBA? An MBA, I have nothing against people having MBA degrees, but that's a degree. It's almost purely a vocational degree designed to increase one's income. Why should the government be financing those kind of degrees? Maybe a bachelor's degree. Now, I'm Italy. When I say that, I mean, where do you draw the line? And I don't know. But you could make uh, a lot of the money that we uh, give out and uh, lend out is for graduate education. It's not undergraduate education. And maybe we ought to put some limits on that. So you could say 30, 40 percent of what we're spending on doing these things. It would be hard to get it through Congress. Well, you know, we have a impossible situation in Washington here and as they do over much of the uh, Western world these days. Uh, Britain isn't any better really. Uh, uh, maybe marginally. But uh, so uh, the, there, there are things that can be done. What about making colleges have some skin in the game? What if you say, you know, the reason these kids borrow all this money and the reason they, the colleges have to accept them. And so the colleges are complicit in this in that they lure kids to their campuses, in some cases knowing that the kid is very unlikely to succeed. But they want to collect tuition revenue from the student, at sometimes state subsidies from the state government. And so they do that. And they do it with a, knowing there's a high probability the students will not graduate and a high probability that they will default on their loans. Well, knowing that, uh, maybe that's undesirable public policy to allow that to happen. At least the colleges should, if the, they have a, abuse of this and they have a 20 or 30 percent of their students not paying back their loans, maybe we should say to the colleges, okay, you pay some of that back. And so uh, I'm a great believer in skin in the game as a sort of an intermediate solution to my long-run desire to just get the federal government out of this business completely. But that would be a nice, you know, intermediate step. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Mark McDaniel and Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.